How are you? I'm okay. I'm a survivor. That's the one thing. That's right. We're out here because these are our people. They're just like any any of us. They just um, have some extra barriers to accessing care that we're trying to break down for them. Welcome. My name is Brett Feldman. I'm the director of street medicine at USC. Today we travel to Oakland, California, a city with a long and proud history of fighting against racism and for social justice. We'll join Dr. Jay Reichling and Lifelong Street Medicine to see how they've joined in that struggle for liberation with their weapon of choice being street medicine. This is the second of four videos brought to you by Invisible People and California Healthcare Foundation designed to bring our research on street medicine in California to life. Let's go check it out. So we're really a registered nurse led um, model of a program. So we have a full-time registered nurse, um, associate social worker and community health worker on each team. And then our providers go out with each team three half days per week. This is a pretty rough block for us right now. There was a recent uh, overdose methamphetamine batch that got mixed fentanyl inside of it, and there were multiple overdoses simultaneously. There was Narcan that was on scene that our teams have been providing, but when multiple overdoses happen all at one time, um, it overwhelmed the community. EMS was able to revive several people, but, but one person, people were unaware, had also overdosed, and that person unfortunately passed away. Wow. And and so the community here is still um, grieving and, and the teams are um, in that space uh, to be able to offer behavioral health services as uh, after and then continue the uh, education around fentanyl uh, overdoses here on the streets until we're able to deal as a, as a health system and as a society with um, destigmatizing addiction to be able to make substance use safe for people is, is absolutely critical and until we do so We'll continue to have this this uh, scourge of, of overdoses. So, right here where we're standing at is where he was laying out, and we was unable to revive him. Paramedics unable to revive him. The streets are dangerous. Yes, you have to mind your health. Yeah. I've been homeless since January third. Unfortunately, I had some uh, economical problems. Well, I came here 40 years ago to look for a job and found the job and was able to sustain myself all the way up until January 3rd. So that's 40 years in one month. Dr. J and I, we discussed some, some seriousness of my uh, choices I have made so that I won't end up like this gentleman. No, have you ever been hospitalized for anything? Your breathing's okay? Or you sometimes when you walk, you get labored breathing? Oh, yeah. When I'm walking, I get labored. Okay. Do you mind if I just take a look at your heart today? No. Okay. You just hop up here and I'll do an ultrasound, okay? Okay. What I want to do, right, is to make sure your heart's functioning. When people get swelling like this in their legs, I got to make sure the heart's functioning okay. All right? All right. Come around the side. Carl's someone who I've been seeing for a couple weeks. Uh, so far we've only been doing things like giving him food bags, hygiene products, things like that. These are what we call our light touch services. So they're addressing patients' felt needs and the most tangible things that we can give them to satisfy you know, an immediate need. Today though, he finally decided it was time to address some of his health concerns with us. So when I took his blood pressure, it was super elevated. We were able to draw his labs right now. Uh, so those will be like a full panel to scope for, you know, sexually transmitted diseases, infectious disease, as well as our, you know, basic metabolic panels and kidney, liver function, things like that. Dr. J was able to perform a point of care ultrasound today or POCUS, an echo, which allows us to test for things like congestive heart failure. And so that allows us to identify what this patient needs moving forward to ensure his health can stabilize or improve. For Carl, we'll see if maybe he wants to move into our medical respite program after a couple more visits, um, depending on what we see in his medical records when we get those from Kaiser later today. So this is our kind of storage room for all of our client supportive supplies. We have a ton of different types of items in here. Uh, we give out a lot of fire extinguishers for people who want to cook for themselves. We have cookware burners. So we have some of our harm reduction supplies over here. 
So we have uh, safe injection starter kits organized by needle size over here. Kits to test for fentanyl. These are all of our overdose rescue kits. So in each kit, they get two injectable nasal Narcans, as well as two injectable naloxone uh, one milliliter vials. So we do both in each rescue kit because we don't know whose preference, who's gonna be using it. Um, you know, at the end, is it gonna be yourself? Is it gonna be your friend? We don't know what people's comfort levels are like with what, and people have different preferences. So that's why we include both. We do provide referrals and pathways for folks to get into treatment, but you know, first and foremost, we want to know, do you need anything to stay safe? You know, is there anything that you would like to change? How can we help you? Morning. How are you? All right. Good. How long were you outside for? Uh, probably about three, four years. Oh man, the way I was living, you know, I mean, I wasn't even paying attention. It was just a normal life to me. Yeah. I was on the drugs. I can get my drugs every day. Uh, once they came in, my life and just and it helped me with uh, my medical needs and let me know it's more to life. You know what I mean? If I wanted to get help. Yeah. So you know, I've been clean now probably for uh, probably about four or five months to have them. I don't have to take the, uh, the, the boxes and that no more. Okay. Left alone. Wow, congratulations. With the help of them. Right. So what do you think helped you make that switch? Lifelong. I'm serious. Lifelong, I took the time out of listening to what he's talking to me. You know, it, it didn't just happen that, that first day, you know what I mean? Like I said, they put me in a, a, a um, hotel. I started taking my Sebastians. Had you been seeing a doctor before Lifelong? No. How come? I was chasing drugs. It was all about drugs. Okay. You know, they are good people. Yeah. I promise. They are good at what they do. They know how to talk to people. You know what I mean? They, yeah. They're good. They are very good. If they don't come through, it's, it's really hard. Without them, you just, you stuck. Yeah. You don't have no help. Uh, so, you know, we need them. We appreciate them, man. Without them, I'm telling you, every, like I said, everybody know life wrong. Yeah, so people will go through a journey where, the, where they will go from um, being dependent on either fentanyl or heroin, those are the big ones out here, um, and they'll move on to buprenorphine and then they'll taper off of, of buprenorphine. Um, and what that does for folks, obviously, is it puts money back in people's pocket, it creates a level of stability, it removes some sources of danger for them, and allows people a chance to focus on health um, and housing. Well, housing obviously is health in our work. We find uh, with street medicine, stability in our complex healthcare system is absolutely critical towards giving people an opportunity to engage in a long journey around health. We find that we do some basic things in the street. We joke a lot about leveraging urgent care towards primary care. The whole concept there is listening to what's important to people here on the street, being able to respond to that. But oftentimes, that particular engagement, whether it's around hepatitis C or wound care, can be a pathway to launch us towards much larger issues in people's lives, um, as I was mentioning, around both mental health and physical health. I have been out here for like 20, 20 some years, and maybe then sometimes I feel like committing suicide. And Miss K right here and Gus here, they really have helped me come along a long way within this last year. These guys have helped me mentally, physically, and emotionally, come as far as I'm concerned. Because they helped me do a lot of things that I was going through. Because they showed me that they care. They showed me that they got love, and they, they got compassion, and they concern. A pleasure to meet you. Anthony, we've been working together probably about a year, and he came to us primarily for medical. He has diabetes and it has affected one of his feet and his kidneys. And uh, since we've known Anthony, he's been going to a podiatrist regularly. He gets wound care here out on the streets. Our nurse comes by every week and fills a medi set for him to make sure that he's getting his insulin and uh, his blood pressure medicine. And uh, the last few months he's been engaging with me more and I do the behavioral health aspect. So we do weekly therapy, um, case management, help him uh, get ahead of on his goals. And he actually just got approved for uh, an apartment that we're waiting on, which is incredibly, incredibly rare. Um, I don't want to give anyone the impression that that happens out here because it really doesn't. One of the most interesting statistics that I've heard about this area, around 450,000 
jobs were added, mostly in the tech sector in the Bay Area between like 2005 and 2015. Same 10 year period, there's about 50,000 housing units that were added. Those 450,000 jobs are high paying tech jobs, right? And right there, you have the beginning of a total crisis where you're adding jobs and you're not adding, adding housing. Areas like West Oakland here became a highly desirable area to live. So this community has seen rapid expansion and gentrification. Oakland itself was statistically almost 40% black American in 2005. And in 2015 was around 25%. So what's happening in real time is that the gentrification and its associated determinants of bias, including racism, right, are causing a massive homeless crisis of a predominantly black American population that is from West Oakland. When we do street medicine in this region, our demographic base is approximately 70% black American, which lays very wide open and bare the problem of, of racism in this country. All of the Bay Area is now on this system. Oh, really? So when people come and talk to me, I can add a fingertip straight into their records with consent, obviously, right? Yeah. And so she's so she's saying she doesn't know exactly what what medications that she's supposed to be on, and so I'm I'm actually just scrolling through to figure out what what she's supposed to be on. And then I have arthritis in my leg, which I can only walk like a half a block before I have to, you know, stop and start again. Well, I've been hit on the bicycle now four times. The last time I got hit on the bicycle, the car came up from behind me, speeding, hit me in the bicycle leg, and kept going. It's it's hard. It's hard. It's hard out here. It's real hard out here. But like, if it wasn't for them, if it wasn't for them coming around from neighborhood to neighborhood, trust me, a lot, a lot of us, a lot of us, they make sure we have food. They make sure our health is up, up to date. You know, they do all they can for us. We actually came here yesterday, so I just did a bunch of services here yesterday afternoon, so that when we showed up, like we didn't just get in overrun with requests. We do a reasonable number of joint injections and um, abscess and drainage procedures, uh, which is why we wanted a bus that allows us to, to be able to have a private space. Also, sometimes like intense conversations on the street, sometimes people prefer to move on to the van just for privacy. It's funny, like sometimes people will be talking about something in their space and you won't get a layer of complexity but as soon as you go onto the bus things kind of open up and you start to hear more about uh, the nuances and details of somebody's situation as people get to know the program and get to know the bus right then there's this flip that happens where then oh the bus is here and then word spreads the bus is here and it's not that i think teams don't want to come out and talk to people but it's that you end up with such a line of people like we had yesterday that it's just like it's actually more efficient to see people on the bus only because you're moving faster than you would on foot. But to your point, there are people in tents that won't engage in that way, right? And so the challenge is like making sure that you always do tent to tent, RV to RV um, outreach at the same time, I agree. That you go to the yeah. people. Yep, yep. So these teams can refer patients directly in the medical respite, which is nice because they can bypass the hospital, obviously, wow. presuming their acuity is appropriate. Yeah. But even in the medical respite with a beautiful clinic, right, like you have to go room to room and do and do rounds. How are you? I'm okay. I'm a survivor. That's the one thing. That's right. We're out here because these are our people, you know, like they're just like any, any of us. They just um, have some extra barriers to accessing care that we're trying to break down for them. My own personal journey is around having been working in Sub-Saharan Africa for a few years after residency. A friend told me about a street medicine job in Oakland, which was going to be a temporary thing for me to try and help out some of the most, what I found out to be some of the most marginalized populations in the United States. And long story short, um, I was shocked to find that some of the statistics around mortality um, with people who um, experience homelessness mirror those of some of the poorest places in the world uh, right here in our own country um, and one of the richest countries in the world. Well, for me it's very much a calling to be um, of service to be able to assist people in finding their own version of wellness in their life and I consider myself lucky to be able to do so. 
Following lifelong street medicine was a masterclass in transdisciplinary care with people from different types of training and different backgrounds coming together for the benefit of the patient, of course, led by the patient. In the next video, we're going to Bakersfield, California in the dry riverbeds where the temperature can get over 110 degrees. We'll follow Dr. Baer and his team at Clinica Sierra Vista and see how they connect with people through their pets. This video series is brought to you by the California Healthcare Foundation. Go to chcf backslash streetmedicine to watch all four videos and download our research. Thank <music> you.